what is up, y'all? What is up, y'all? What is up, y'all? What is up, y'all? Yeah. Man, welcome to the Grove, home of the Grove, where we love people. Wait, no, no, wrong order, sorry. We love God, we love people, and we do stuff. I'm going to be clear, I say that a lot. It's like a modified vision statement. <laughs> we do have a very specific vision statement. Uh, but that uh, sums up what we do. Real quick before we get going, we are continuing in our series asking for a friend. Uh, I don't know where you guys fall in this. If you've been with us the last two weeks, which many of you have, I see a few new faces, whether it's college or you're legitimately new. And obviously it's young adult ministry, so y'all cycle out by the week. We see some of you for two weeks, and we don't see you for four weeks. And then we see you for six weeks, and we don't see you for eight weeks. Uh, and that's okay. Uh, but one of the visions behind this series was that the world, uh, and I don't think anybody would disagree with this, has a lot of questions about faith. I think even maybe for believers in the room that are willing to be honest, no matter how much quote-unquote faith we have, we have questions, right? And one thing we want to stand for as uh, a ministry and a church and as believers is that we're not afraid of those questions because God is the maker and the creator, therefore he knows the answers to all of them, and we should enter in appropriately. So that's what we're doing. We're in week three of this. Real quick, has the last two weeks of answering we're on, we've answered at least 11 submitted hard questions of faith. Has this been beneficial to anybody? Like you've had questions, you're like, I've actually thought that and I've had an answer. Cool, cool, cool. And for those that didn't raise their hands, I didn't know you knew all the answers. Maybe you should come teach. That's great. We'll meet later and you can tell me the secrets of life, you dirty liars. Just kidding, I love y'all. All right, before we get going, I need y'all to turn to a neighbor, turn to a neighbor, turn to a neighbor. I need you to just touch pointer fingers. Just touch pointer fingers just like this, just like this. I need you to look at them in the eyeballs, and I need you to whisper, E.T., come home. Isn't that the scene? Is that what the scene is? Flown home, phone home. All right, let's try a different one. Let's try a different one. Turn to a different neighbor. Turn to a different neighbor. Just connect knuckles. You know what I'm saying? I need full knuckle contact. I need you to look them. Look straight at their eyebrows. Don't look at their eyeballs. Look at their eyebrows. Don't lose contact with them things. And I need you to say this in the most loving way possible. Them things bushy. <laughs> okay. All right. Yes. Yes. Man, some of y'all need to hit up that shop and have them things plucked in Jesus' name, okay? Less is more, all right? I want to be very clear. I do make up those on the spot every single week. I don't think about it at a time. Whatever I think in the moment is what I say out loud. That can either be good or bad. I don't know that that was Holy Spirit, to be honest with you. I think we need to discern what Holy Spirit says. I think that was Phil. All right. All right. Awesome. All right, y'all. We're going to get into it. We're going to get into it. So if you've been with us before I pray and get this night going, um, how we've been formatting this and we've been filming it. So if you missed, well, the first week didn't work out, technical difficulties. But if you missed last week and you want to go check out the questions that were asked and how they were taught, I think it's an 18-minute video. So you can jump on YouTube, follow The Grove GFCS, Grace Fellowship Church Shrewsbury, The Grove GFCS, and you can watch that. So go ahead and check that out. Um, but what we're going to do, similar to week one, is I'm going to give us like a 10 to 15-minute answer to what I viewed as a big question. Um, they're all big, but... Uh, then we're going to give you guys time, probably about 20 to 30 minutes in your groups to uh, work as a team to answer a separate question. So at your individual tables, a leader has a question, and one of these tables probably does not have a leader, which is this table, which probably means I'll go with you unless this table splits up. We'll figure that out. We'll figure that out. Okay, and then I'll go there. Cool. You got me. You guys are screwed. All right. So we're going to split you guys off. One thing we're big in this series is, is we believe this. It's, it's pretty simple. That if we tell you guys the answers to hard questions, that does next to nothing for you. Cool, it gives you an answer. It makes you feel good. So you walk out and TikTok tells you something different. If we empower you to answer questions for yourself, then when questions arise, you are equipped to answer them instead of doubt. 
That's what we want with this series. I want to be very clear with you guys as someone who has a scientific background and didn't believe this stuff for a long time uh, and has a lot of non-saved friends. I'm constantly faced with questions of people asking why I believe what I believe and this, that, and the other, and what about this, and what about this, and it used to be hard. I'm going to be very clear with you. It's not anymore. <laughs> It's all about if we equip ourselves and we want to equip you guys to be young people in a generation of questions who have the answers. Amen. All right, I'm going to pray for us. I'm going to introduce the question. I'm going to briefly lead us in and then we'll get into groups. All right, so if you would pray with me. Jesus, we thank you right now, first and foremost, for you, uh, for everything we do wrong, every way we fall short, every way we aren't enough, you are. And I thank you for that, God, because I, I just feel like I'm constantly reminded of how short I fall, and yet you meet every criteria that I try to. I thank you that that's the same for every person in this room, whether or not they realize it. God, I thank you that you're not scared of our doubts. I thank you you're not scared of our questions, our anger, our indifference. You're not scared of any of it, God. In fact, you want us to bring it to you. So when we start answering hard questions, I genuinely believe you're sitting up there smiling, watching us get ready for war. So I pray for this group right now, whatever it ends up looking like, whether it's their schools or their works or their families, that this would equip them for war to help them answer questions and bring people into the kingdom of God only thing that matters. We love you and we trust you with this time. And all God's people sang. Come on now. Okay now. All right. All right. We got a couple new friends who are like, y'all really sing like that? Yes, we do. That's what that's what heaven about to sound like. So I'm going to sing it here. I, listen, if y'all play some sports, you don't just go to the game. You practice before the game. If heaven about to sound like that, I'm going to practice here. So we got a, a, a couple new friends. We got some college friends back. I'm not going to intro you. We know y'all. We're happy you're back, though. I think we have two, two new friends, two new friends. I got a scan for them. No, 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 still not there. Okay. Tavon, Tavon, can you just throw your hand up real quick? Everybody say hi, Tavon. Welcome to the cult. You'll never leave. Oh, my brother, Tyler. Can you throw your hand? This is my brother, Tyler, right here. Everybody say hi, Tyler. Tyler and I are close friends. He's the worst. Don't talk to him. Nah, just kidding. He's an awakened senior, and this is his first Grove. I didn't, you should have told me you were coming, bro. I'm excited you're here, though. All right, our first question is this. We're going to get right into it to make sure you guys have time in your groups, all right? The question was this. Again, these are uh, questions you guys submitted uh, for the most part, uh, literally on little pieces of paper. So here it is. The question is, how do we reconcile science, evolution, etc., and our faith when it seems like Parts of it don't match up. How do we reconcile science, evolution, etc., when it feels like parts of it don't match up? Let's be honest. We're a hot church, honest, open, transparent. How many of y'all have thought something like that? No. Okay, let's talk real quick. Gracie, you've never questioned science. Stop. Montana, you've never questioned science, ever. Stop, liar. KT, did your hand go up? Oh, it did? Okay. Awkward. <laughs> I lost. I just was looking at their table. So this is, uh, and I'm going to prove to you that this is one of the most common questions in your generation, whether or not you know it. Um, <clears throat> there was a book I read last year. It was from the Barna Group. The Barna Group, if you don't know them, I would encourage you to look them up, follow them on socials, subscribe to their website. Like, they're amazing. They're a Christian research study group. Uh, it's statistically based. They don't do studies that are like, we find what we want to find. No, it's like, we want to find the truth. And what the beautiful thing is, if the truth is Jesus, the statistics always line up. And their website proves that. Uh, one of the studies they did a few years back, and they wrote a book about it, was the six main reasons the young generation is leaving the church. Six main reasons the young generation is le reading, leaving the church. I saw this book, and immediately I ordered 20 of them. And I'm not joking, I did. Uh, I gave it to my awakened leadership team, and we studied it last year, and we did an entire series on it. Why? Because the minute I see that, Okay, there's six main reasons young people leave the church. I'm finna attack all six of them and make everybody feel better. <laughs> That's exactly what we did. 
Number four reason. I'll put up two fingers. The number four reason was this. Churches come across as antagonistic to science. It was the number four reason young people today are leaving the church in large quantities, unfortunately. And, and I'm going to be very frank. They're all bad reasons. We just don't look for the answers, which is why we're here. But churches come across as antagonistic to science. So I'm just going to give you a quick background of me if you don't already know. Many of you probably do, so I'll keep it quick. But I understand this feeling firsthand. It was probably the primary reason I was willing to walk away from church was I just didn't, like, I have a science brain. I always have. I've always enjoyed science. Like, in high school, biology was my favorite course. Chemistry, eh. But biology, I really loved. I loved studying, like, living organisms and kind of what they do and how they grow, all this different stuff. And, and I remember in high school, as I was considering my college major, thinking, like, my mom and dad are trying to make me follow this faith and whatever. And I, to be clear, I appreciate them doing that. Um, but it just so much didn't line up for me. Like, just things were missing and it really did affect my faith in a very negative way to the point where, if you know my testimony, I went to college and I fell away from faith for quite, uh, well, not, maybe not quite a few years, but at a bare minimum, a couple years. But I had always been this science-minded person. I did go to college and I studied biology and chemistry. Biology is a major, chemistry is a minor. Uh, I worked for about six years as a chemist in three different major companies. Uh, like the whole, wherever y'all at in school, college, whatever, like the honors biology and like whatever, all that stuff, right? So that was where I was at, and I really liked that stuff. Um, even to the point where I was a nerd, whether or not you would know that about me, because some of y'all think I'm dumb out here, you know what I'm saying? Uh, but literally got first place in a district science fair for a botany project I did. Like, <laughs> you didn't know that was me, but that's your boy right here, okay? Uh, to be specific, I studied the effect of acidity on plant growth, and the, they, the judges loved it, <laughs> you know. Anyways, <laughs> some of y'all like, I liked you because you were an athlete. Now I don't like you anymore, Phil. So science has always fascinated me. It's always intrigued me. And then in college, God changed my whole life, if you know my story, and I started following him, and, and I started to feel these holdbacks in my faith because what I was growing in and experiencing seemed to be hitting uh, kind of these, like, blocks with what I had been studying. Uh, and I even remember having peers and professors telling me my faith and, and, and science couldn't coexist. In fact, I had one specific professor tell me that to my face. And I'll never forget one specific example. I was in uh, comparative vertebrate anatomy. It was my favorite college class. Uh, I forget the professor's name, but it was this lady, and she was, I really liked her, actually. Uh, it was like the third class I had taken with her. But a comparative vertebrate anatomy, all that is is comparing the anatomy of vertebrates over time, a.k.a. evolution. That's what the entire class was about. And I liked it. I liked it a lot. I liked studying that stuff. I liked doing the dissections. I liked studying bone structures, all that stuff. And I'll never forget, near the end of the course, uh, she was talking one day, and she was in a feisty mood, clearly. Uh, and, and she was looking at these bone structures of, like, this compared to this. And she uh, basically summarized that this had evolved into this, and it was clear as day. And she made this statement. She said, can you believe that there's people that think God did this? Yeah. Yeah, in a college classroom, she said that. And, and I remember that hitting me in a way where I didn't feel discouraged. God was like... <laughs> This is your fire to go study this for yourself. So I picked up a bunch of books literally that day, literally that day, uh, among many of them. Uh, one was called Of Pandas and People, an old, uh, it used to be a school textbook, and it's Christian based, and it talks about all that different stuff on a Christian perspective. Uh, why the fossils still say no. There's literally a book, an entire book you can go buy, why the fossils don't line up. Uh, and my favorite one was The Evolution of a Creationist, and he was an a anatomical professor at Baylor, and a student challenged him, hey, go study creation versus evolution, and like, then talk to me. And the, the professor took it as a challenge to be like, I'm going to go disprove creationism. Became a Christian, wrote a book about how evolution doesn't make sense. One of my favorite books of all time. But, but that was kind of my process, right, so of where I got to where I was and needing to study for this stuff my, myself. And, and um, I, I, I kind of came to the point, and I know a lot of you, especially in collegiate environments, you're going to get a lot of perspectives that tell you the opposite. And it is why so many young people are leaving the church. But I want to encourage you that today for a brief moment here, we're going to go to school a little bit. Yeah, John, you were sleeping. 
We're going to go to school a little bit, and I want to give you guys, I'm going to be clear, what I'm going to talk about right now isn't about right or wrong. I'm not trying to disprove anything to you. What I am trying to do is correct narratives that have been given to you one-sidedly that you've never been given the opportunity to hear the other side. And then for you to intellectually decide on your own what you want to believe, okay? And that's my goal today. So I'm going to define science real quick. Science, the definition is this, the study of the physical and natural world. Look that up if you want. That's what science is, the study of the physical and natural world. I'm going to read a couple of verses to you so you know this isn't just Phil Cook saying words to your face. Genesis 1-3 says this, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good and that he separated or sorry, that's verse three. I said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And then Romans 1.20. Romans 1.20. Feel free to look at these for yourself. If you can keep up. I already marked these ahead of time. For since the creation of the world. It's one of my favorite verses. God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. I redefine science for myself, at least, and I define it this way, the study of God's creation. Science is defined in the world as the study of the physical and natural world. I've learned to define science as the study of God's creation. What we're going to talk about primarily right now is creation versus evolution. I want to ask the question again. How many of you at a bare minimum have asked the question of creation versus evolution? Wow, more hands went up. So weird. So in, in the, the point number four about how, like, the young people are leaving because they feel like, uh, the church is antagonistic to science. 23% of those people, so that's a big demographic, that the primary reason they said that, like that they picked that number four, was because they were, and I quote, turned off by the creation versus evolution debate. So like a large number of young people leave the church because they're turned off by the creation versus ev- evolution debate. So we're going to talk about it because there's no reason to talk not to talk about it. I'm going to ask a couple questions. Do we trust and believe that God is creator? Yes. Don't answer them for me. I'm going to answer them for you. Do we trust and believe that God is creator? Yes. He created us and everything else. The Bible tells us that. There's way too much. There's way too much, y'all, complexity and intricacy and specific parameters in creation. Gosh, if you took 10 minutes to study, like, astronomy And the way that things are all pulled together, our brother Connor Smith, who's an Awaken leader, literally works down at Johns Hopkins in the physics lab. And he did this amazing message at Awaken about like, and it was actually went way over my head. But he like, he gave us numbers and mathematical equations of how if this stuff was even 0.0000001% different, we'd all be dead and planets would be crashing into each other and it'd be a hot mess. Kind of like some of our lives, we need the 0.001%, you know what I'm saying? But let me ask you another question. With that said, is evolution real and provable? Yes. Now, I'm going to explain that. I'm going to explain that. Let me give you a couple kind of generic examples. On the first side, the faith side of things, like do we trust God made this whole thing that he's really, he's doing his thing. For me in my life, I have on countless occasions, and I do mean countless, prayed to God for something just to see it miraculously happen almost immediately. On many occasions, I've physically experienced the presence of God in undeniable ways. I've watched as following God has changed my life as well as hundreds, if not thousands, of other people that I've been able to walk alongside or witness in their lives. It's changed everything about me, how I live, how I treat people, how I speak, how I act, and all of the above. I've seen sick people healed. I've seen broken people restored, and I've seen a ton of that. I've seen all types of different things, the lost be found, fill in the blank. I've watched his people give away and sacrifice their time and resources for no other reason but they say they love God. I haven't seen that in the world. So I've watched these things. It's evidence and there's proof that God is everywhere, always first in his creation and secondly in his people, if not in a million other things. Yet, have I also done amoeba culture studies where within 24 hours, One amoeba culture was another one. Yeah, I have done that personally. I did a three-month Drosophila genetic fly study, just did the exact same study. 
where you start with flies and you mate them intentionally versus of genotypes and phenotypes is actually kind of savage. You put like basically chloroform into a tube. You knock them out cold. You dump them out on the desk. You find the ones with certain phenotypes, meaning what they look like, their colors, their wing type, and you mate them appropriately, put them into a new tube to get a new species. I watched it happen after three months. We took something that was one way that looked a completely different way at the end. I did that firsthand. I've sat in a three-hour lecture of leadi like leading anatomical scientists from like New York University, which is the number one place for that, where he compared physical bone structures about the evidence uh, and similarities of certain species. In fact, my senior project was to dissect a cadaver to, to study like organ aging and how organs change over time, all part of evolution. I took a seminar on neurobiology and moods and emotions and how the brain adapts over time. Jess actually dropped that class because we weren't at a good point at that time. It ended up being one of my favorite classes in the world it's for a different, different day. <laughs> After the first lecture, she dropped the class because we were in it together. Praise Jesus for redemption. Here's, here's my point. Here, here's the pivot. I think we need to, I think we need to change the argument. Because if the argument is people are leaving the church because of creation versus evolution, I think we have to be intelligent young people to change the argument to creation and evolution. And I'm going to break that down a little bit because there's parameters to this. Like there's levels to this. It's not about just accepting what everything they say while also blindly trusting Jesus. That's not it. That's not it. You can be intelligent and believe both. So what's my point? Can we study science, be intellectual, learn new things while also knowing and trusting that God's running the whole show? Yes, you can. It should never be a reason you leave church, ever. Okay. I'm going to talk briefly about why, and I'm going to get you guys into groups. I'm going to define evolution. Evolution is this, and this is, again, straight off, you know, the, you know what's the, the Webster's? I'm going to say Wikipedia. The process by which different kinds of living organisms are thought to have developed and diversified from earlier forms during the history of the earth. The process by which different kinds of living organisms, and I did put this in, uh, er, in caps, but this was my edit, are thought to have developed and diversified from earlier forms during the history of the earth. So why do I define that? Here's why. The idea of evolution is very vague. It's ironic to me that the idea of evolution is so triggering to people when the actual definition of evolution is extremely vague. Like evolution in and of itself is, is a very lofty up there idea. And yet we let something like that because of the internet and strong voices and whatever, whatever, affect us in such a strong way. Uh, like I think what we do is we misconceive as a culture and as a people, that evolution is simply this. Monkeys turned into humans. Evolution. <sighs> you know? And that's what we think evolution is. So we get confused and, and we start to break and we start to butt heads and evolution becomes this trigger word. It's a, we've made something that is a generic vague idea. We've made it a trigger word somehow. Not somehow. Again, it's social media and the news sources and all these different things. When it doesn't have to be, I want to be clear about that. Evolution as a Christian should not make you shudder. Oh my gosh, I don't know what I'm going to say because they brought up evolution. I shouldn't do that. I'm going to give you some more things to think about. Evolution, in fact, is so wide scoping that there are six branches of evolution that they're trying to figure out. Like, like, again, I think we think, like, evolution, monkeys turn to humans, and that just doesn't line up with biblical creation. No, if you go into, like, 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 collegiate-based scientific evolution, they had to branch it into six primary categories, which all have their own categories because of how little they really know about what evolution is. How about this? Don't believe me? I'll tell you what they are. They are this, convergent evolution, divergent evolution, co-evolution, reverse or parallel evolution. How about that, y'all? They're so unsure of things that they're convinced there's actually reverse evolution. You can look that up. AKA species can evolve to something and then evolve back. <laughs> evolve backwards. It's like you're playing Pokemon and your game died and you had to start over. I had Bulbasaur and I went to Ivysaur and I got Bulbasaur again. <laughs> if I clip something for YouTube, it'll be that. <laughs> 
And then the last two, which I'm going to talk about, are microevolution and macroevolution. So those are the six primary forms of evolution. I hope already you're like, I'm less concerned about evolution. I'm going to focus on micro and macro. Those are going to be the two things I talk about very briefly. I think this is important. I picked these two for a reason. Understanding these two things really changed my doubt of faith in science, these two specifically. So I'm going to define them both. Microevolution, microevolution is intraspecies genetic changes, okay? Also known as speciation. That's another word that you could pull from that. Some of my science nerds are already like loving this. Some of you are like, Phil, I can't wait till you're done because I don't know what you're saying and I don't care. That's okay. So intraspecies genetic changes, also known as speciation. I'm going to give some examples of what that is, examples of what microevolution is. Your mother and your father, one night, during the day, had a glass of whiskey, felt frisky. <laughs> Listen, y'all, that is not in the notes. <laughs> okay, y'all know where I'm going with this, okay? Mom and dad did that thing, okay? And then you came out. Now, what are you? You are simply a genetic anomaly of 50% DNA from your mother, 50% DNA from your father. You are very much part of them, yet very much different than them. What is that? That's evolution, that is speciation within the human species. Your mom looked a certain way. Your dad looked a certain way. You are a mix of both of them. Therefore, you look different. You're shorter than your dad or mom. Maybe you're taller than your dad or mom. Maybe you have a different skin pigment, a different hair type. Like maybe some of you have good eyes, some bad eyes. I looked at Lydia with glasses. And my daughter, neither me or my wife has glasses. My daughter's four and already has glasses. Like whatever it may be, that's evolution. Something changed, right? That's microevolution. It's observable. You can look at it and see it happening. It's clearly real. I'll give you another example. Recently, I met someone uh, that had a dog. Actually, I was in uh, Wisconsin. They had a Pomeranian Husky mix. <laughs> in my notes, I say, don't ask me how. That's the <laughs> next sentence. That's so funny, Summer. Um, and I remember asking, like, that's the fluffiest, most adorable dog I've ever seen. What is this? And they were like, it's a Pomeranian Husky mix. And then my mind went. <laughs> I said, whose dad? Whose mom? Where were you guys? What alternate reality is this possible? But, but this dog literally was a perfect mix between a tiny little fluffy Pomeranian and a huge fluffy Husky. It was a miniature fluffy Husky big Pomeranian. What is that? That's speciation, intraspecies genetic changes, evolution M on the micro level, on the micro level, okay? Just let me give you a couple quick other examples. New strains of flu viruses <clears throat> or COVID, anybody, like they made you get a shot, okay? Did or didn't, don't care. How many more have they told you to get since? 37? Why? Why? Intra, intraspecies genetic changes. So that virus doesn't look the same as it used to. That's evolution. It evolved, okay? So it's real. It's observable. You can look at Darwin's studies of the Galapagos. Like, he was the main guy, right? Also, the same thing on his deathbed. He was like, I don't know if any of this is real, but I know God's real. You can look that up for yourself. That came from Darwin himself. But his studies were valid. There was microevolution going on. Microevolution is observable and is not unbiblical. That's what some of y'all need to hear today. Microevolution is observable and not unbiblical. And no point in the Bible does God say, like, the species I created and how I created them aren't going to just keep going and doing their thing. You know, that, that's never said. That's never even alluded to. In fact, I would argue it plays a, a role in the beauty and diversity to which God created. Part of the diversity. Like, you don't get, how about this? The Bible says all nations and tongues will, will be in heaven, Right? If he just made, like, if he just put, like, white people here and black people here and Hispanic people here and Chinese people here and said, all y'all going to eventually end up with me, that's not what he was saying. He was saying, y'all are going to, in your time here, make diversity, and you're going to find new languages, and you're going to create things because that's what I made you to do. I'm creator, therefore my people will create. But in the end of days, all nations and tongues will be with me. He almost alludes to microevolution. So by how we view it. All right. 
So I hope right off the bat you might leave tonight with like some relief if you needed it. And if you didn't, how about just some uh, knowledge or encouragement that evolution is not a word you should be scared of. In fact, I think at its core, it's not anti-Bible. It actually encourages what God had to say. Uh, a, a prominent pastor and Ph.D. in theological studies who I follow, he, he says about this topic this, quote unquote, microevolution is both good science and lines up with biblical creation. I'm going to say microevolution is good science and lines up with biblical creation. The world will not tell you that because they're trying to get a point across. Now, macroevolution, I'm going to talk about this way less. Macroevolution is long term and, and large scale and results in the formation of new species. I'm going to give you a really quick, like, just breakdown of if this micro-macro thing, okay? So if, if something is macroscopic, that means you can just look at it. It's just there, right? Microscopic, what does it mean? It means you've got to look a little deeper. So you need a microscope to look at something microscopic. So when we look deep at, at microevolution, we can see, oh, this makes sense. Like, there's these little, tr like, shifts, changes, reproduction, all this different stuff. Now, macro evolution, stuff that should be right in front of us if it was truly macroscopic. For example, Dalton, to me, right now is macroscopic. I can look at him and see it. Macro evolution, like, long-term and large-scale evolution is not right in front of us, or it would be proven by now. Like, we'd be able to look at the whole monkey to human, uh, you know, and if you're educated in that, that's not really what they argue. Actually, it's monkeys to, like, this intermediate thing to another intermediate thing to another intermediate thing. So that's actually never been the argument. So, like, don't go to a non-believer and be like, we didn't come from monkeys because if they're intelligent, they're going to be like, nobody ever said we did. That's just for you to store back here. But macroevolution, while there are theories and there's pieces of evidence presented for certain areas of this, and there are, this is where I think we have to be a little more careful. We can accept microevolution. We can look at what was, is observable and that we can see, and we can actually say it actually furthers our faith. Uh, I think we have to be a little more careful when it comes to this idea that one species just becomes another over time. Because to accept fully, to accept fully the idea of species evolving into one another all the way up to humans takes God out of the equation. And on top of that, it makes nature God. He says, we don't need a God. Nature is God. Nature can just do it by itself, his self, herself. So what we encourage you to learn and research for yourself, I, I think hopefully this is encouraging to you that these are fairly easily combated ideas if we do a little bit of research. Like, it's not hard to have someone come to you and have this question and be like, hey, I got some stuff for you if you're willing to hear it. But in the end, I want to just kind of close with this. It, it's the theory of evolution. Okay? So, like, if anybody were to come to you and be like, well, what about evolution? Like, at the bare minimum, if you don't remember anything I just said, it is to this day and will always be the theory of evolution, which means, a.k.a., haven't figured it out, not even close, probably never will. Let me define theory for you. Trying to explain why natural phenomenon occur, I'd argue we have the explanation so I'll close with this. Should we be scared of evolution? No. Is evolution real? Yes. Can they coexist? Yes. Did God make it all? Yes. It is important to do your own research and be intelligent on these things? Yes. All right. Here's what we're going to do. Now that we've answered that question, I'm going to send you guys to your group. So at your different tables, your leaders all have your question with them. I'm going to give you guys 20-ish minutes. That's kind of what we've been floating around. Um, your goal in this time is as a group to uh, address the question, talk about it, answer the question, and then teach the question, okay? So kind of a blueprint we've given you guys is like make sure to read what the question is, uh, maybe talk about a few things you guys established and stuff like that, um, and then give us like solid, like convince us, you know what I'm saying, in a way that you would convince an unbeliever. It's kind of the primary goal, all right? All right. Go ahead and get after it. You got 20 minutes. Okay, so our question was, do unborn babies go to heaven? Yeah. Okay, so we came up with four uh, verses that would help support this claim. Um, 
the first one being Genesis 127. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. And then the second one is Psalm 139.13, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. And then Jeremiah 1.5, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. And then Deuteronomy 139. And the little ones that you said would be taken captive, your children who do not yet know good from bad, they will enter the land. I will give it to them, and they will take possession of it. So the way we thought about this was Jesus pre-cleansed us when he died on the cross, right? And since these babies haven't sinned yet because they're not born, Therefore, they're sinless, so they're going to go to heaven, is what we thought. So, yeah. That's, yeah. that's what I got. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'm taking it. Uh, it's not mine, but thank you. Um, hey there. Uh, you got a lot of science talk earlier, but I'm going to talk about more science. Uh, I actually just learned that Phil was a scientist. Um, he's, he's a real scientist. I'm a self-proclaimed scientist, so yeah, it's, it's good enough. So um, I'm going to talk about the Big Bang Theory. Um, we had a lovely question from one of our Grovians. Um, if scientists talk about the Big Bang, how does that get compared to Christianity? Um, it's a tough question. We, we really uh, really duked it out at our table. So um, my, my first thought is... Uh, uh, figuring out what like most people think of as the Big Bang. And my best guess is that um, most of you guys think about the Big Bang. I, sorry, I say most of you guys. When I was eight years old, I watched a show called like How the Universe Works, and I would like fall asleep watching to this documentary of like the Big Bang Theory and stuff like that. So like for people that aren't into science, um, uh, the Big Bang is just this like, explanation of how the universe was nothing and then it kind of exploded and there was light and then like everything after like billions of years came to what it is now. Um, but <laughs> uh, the actual scientists, um, I don't know uh, which scientists this person was uh, hearing from, but hopefully my guess is it wasn't uh, astrophysicists or anything like that because if you hear an astrophysicist talk about the Big Bang Theory, they'll tell you that it's a theory, um, but they'll also tell you that um, the Big Bang Theory is actually not a theory about how the universe was created, but um, it basically is a theory of how it developed into what it is now over billions of years. Um, so with that, it's a theory, first of all, so um, it's not proven. Uh, it's just an explanation um, that we have. It's, it's one of our best explanations. Um, but since it doesn't talk about the creation of the universe, um, it's actually just completely unrelated to uh, the Christian creation in the Bible, um, if you think of it that way. Um, look at my notes here. Yeah, so like what Phil said earlier, um, most people, if you talk to them, they're, they're kind of just going to use that. Uh, they're going to be uneducated, and they're going to bring it up, and they just need something 
and they're not really putting a lot of effort into refuting uh, your faith or our faith. Um, so if, if you just know the simple fact that like it doesn't explain how it was created and you just tell them that science you know, doesn't actually have an answer for how it was created like the Bible does in Genesis, um, you can just ask them like, um, well, I, I, like, <laughs> I need a little bit more effort um, or you should put in a little bit more effort into uh, finding something that would refute the uh, creation that you find in the Bible, and then that would lead someone to actually looking into biblical creationism, uh, which is good, because they may become an agnostic. That's what happened to me. Um, So say we're, th that was kind of basically if we're refuting an atheist who's very uneducated. Uh, real quick, I'm just going to move into, suppose we're talking to someone who, uh, like, eh, God could be real. Uh, they're an agnostic. Uh, we can kind of, like, start giving them some scripture because they'll be more uh, receptive of it. Um, so now we can kind of just talk about creation and say, well, well, hold on, since we're not scientists, we can say, okay, they're say they're just compatible um we actually have verses that um in our bible that don't ignore uh the creation of the universe but actually uh refer to it and it says that uh the creation actually gives glory to god um so we'll look at psalm 19 uh verse 1 to 4 and i don't have it here so i'm gonna actually like pull it up on my phone here The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. I should probably get out of the King James Version. <laughs> Very poetic, but let's go to the Christian Standard Version for now. <laughs> uh, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the expanse proclaims the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour out speech. Night after night, they communicate knowledge. Uh, there is no speech. There are no words. Their voice is not heard. Their message has gone out to the whole earth and their words to the ends of the world. Um, that's a clear call that uh, creation just communicates the, um, the glory of God and, and uh, the handiwork of his creation. Um, so we have a verse in Matthew uh, 21. I don't know what's going on here, so I'm going to read it. Um, oh, I'm going to have to pull it up. <laughs> okay. Truly, I tell you, this is Jesus talking because he says, truly, I tell you a lot. This is, means he's talking about something important. He doesn't say this too much. If you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree. Oh, boy. So we don't really have context for this verse. So I'm just going to actually stay away from that. <laughs> um, our final verse just comes straight from Genesis. <laughs> um, oh, and this is a really cool one. Uh, and this is an argument uh, to a agnostic about how uh, the Big Bang Theory actually um, can uh, coexist with creationism. God says in Genesis 1 verse 3, let there be light. Um, that actually happened in the Big Bang. There was not light and then there was light. If you want to get a little deeper, it was like 300,000 years after the Big Bang that um, light was like trapped and uh, somehow, like, the universe cooled enough and it, like, escaped. So there was, like, a moment where there was no light, and then suddenly there was light. So that's pretty cool. Um, I guess to wrap it up, um, uh, yeah, this stuff is complicated. So 
if it's complicated, uh, what I would do is be like, oh, okay. Um, yeah, we don't know what we're talking about. Um, But I have noticed one thing is you didn't put a lot of effort into uh, refuting uh, creation. So um, we had a lovely question come up at our table. Uh, <laughs> Do you have it up here? Yes, please. Yeah, my, sorry, my handwriting is terrible. <laughs> um, so the one question um, that kind of we came up with is um, if um, – no, I do. Oh, it's right here. Okay. <laughs> it says if you have to think and put so much effort into understanding the Big Bang Theory, why not put the same effort into understanding God? Um, he didn't go over all of it, but we did go over some scientific things with some theories that the Big Bang Theory kind of breaks, some laws that it breaks, some questions that scientists try to criticize, some scientists that they can't really prove. And there's just so many questions when it's theories on theories on theories. So it's just that same idea that you have to put so much thought into it to really think about it. So you can really ask somebody if that's the case, why not put the same effort into trying just to put a little bit more thought into God's words and seeing what that does. So. So hi guys, um, our question was, why are there so many different Christians that disagree with each other on things? Didn't your own God even pray for unity among his believers? So yes, God did call for his believers to have unity. Um, and the first question I wanna ask you is, why would God want us to be unified? Why would God want the church to be unified? And we kind of talked as a group, um, an army, they're all united when they're going in for one mission. And if they're not united, bad things can happen. Some people could die, some people could go off on their own. But the basis is an army is most effective when it is united. Um, and then we went into John 17, 20, which is my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of men may be one father, just as you are one. So if the church is most effective when it is united, what is the first thing that Satan is going to attack? That unity. So what is necessarily the results of his attacks? Um, meaning, why do these Christians disagree with one another? Um, so the result of his attacks is that Christians have different viewpoints, assumptions, and interpretations on what God's word said. And some people let their pride on these issues override their thoughts and actions so that their viewpoint is right, their assumption is right, their interpretation is right. And then the next question I want to ask you is, are we, as Christians, supposed to let our pride make a mountain out of a molehill? Titus 3.9 says, but avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law, because these are unprofitable and useless. Now, do we need to be united on every subject? No. There are some, if we have questions about our faith and we disagree with some other believers, it could cause us to grow in our faith. If I'm having a conversation with somebody else, we disagree on something, we are going to search for the answer. We are going to dive deeper into that answer. But we do need to agree on the basis of our faith, and that is the gospel. So how do we as Christians then di disagree well? 1 Corinthians 13.2 says, If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. So whenever we disagree, we must love the other person first. We disagreed with God at one point or, or another when we were sinning. When we are sinning, we disagree with God. But what does he do? He loves us first. He comes to us. He gently corrects us, and then we grow in our faith. And as believers, we can disagree well. We can love each other first. Um, we can gently correct one another using the knowledge that we have. And then 
grow deeper in our faith together. So I hope that that answers the questions that were asked. Okay, so literally everything that was a part of her question is going to tie into this one, so I'm just going to go through it anyway. You probably have already heard it before. So our question was, why are there so many denominations or branches of Christianity? And then there's a second part that I'm going to get into later. Well, I kind of our, our group kind of broke it down like this. Denominations are made up of churches. Churches are made up of people. People have disagreements and arguments because people sin. They differ in viewpoints of secondary faith acts that may not be glaring major points, like some others, that change their viewpoints when they dig their heels in and try to defend that and just hyper-focus on that one point. Like Lutherans. Their whole entire thing is based off of one guy, Martin Luther, who kind of revamped the whole entire church system. They got stuck behind a leader instead of Jesus. Methodists, John Wesley literally came up with the whole entire method of how to grow spiritually. Again, they got stuck behind a leader instead of Jesus. All denominations are not necessarily right. Where they are right is in Jesus. And some of the verses that we got through are Corinthians 1, 10 through 17. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of the Lord Jesus, that all of you who agree with one another in whatever you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, some of, I actually don't know how to say that, but all right. Some of a particular person's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. And what I mean is this, one of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apelos. Another, I follow Cephas. Still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Cephas and Gaius, so that no one can say that you were baptized in my name. Yes, I have also baptized the house of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. Way to admit your humanism there, Paul. I love it. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Another section of verses is Romans 14, 1 through 10. Just let me flip there for a sec. Accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling or over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not, and the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall, and they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. One person considers one day more sacred than the other. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord. And they give thanks to God for whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us live for ourselves alone and none of us dies for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this, for this very reason, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. And that's it. I'm not really good at endings. I feel like all of the monarch butterflies decided to migrate into my stomach this year. <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, so our question was, how can you be monotheistic when you believe in the Trinity? And why do you believe in the Trinity? Or how can you when you believe in one God? Um, so for those of you who don't know, 
monotheism is basically the belief in one God. Um, so the first verse that we kind of like used as our focal point is in Deuteronomy. It's Deuteronomy um, 6, 4. And the whole um, context of Deuteronomy 6 is like, where is my, it's literally a reminder of who God is and what he has done. So I think that it's a pretty good verse to use for that. Um, so Deuteronomy 6, 6, 4 says, Hear, O Lord, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So that says the Lord is one. Um, God is one. So God is not three, God is one. Um, the term Trinity is actually not in the Bible anywhere. It was created to describe there being three persons um, because us as people like to try and understand things that God is greater than and we don't have to understand. Um, so, yeah, God is one. Um, so kind of the way um, to kind of understand that is like with every being or thing, there's like the essence to it and there's the person to it. So the essence is what makes us up basically and then the person would be what they are. So if you think of a cake, like the essence of the cake is gonna be the ingredients of the cake and then what it is is it's actually a cake. Um, <laughs> so it's one thing but it, there's like different things in it that have separate roles. Um, so God is one person but there are three separate roles. There's the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. So the Father's role is to be the planner of salvation. The Son's role is the accomplisher of salvation. And then the Spirit's role is to be the applier of salvation to believers. So if you think of like a shamrock, it's like one plant that has three leaves. Um, so then we also had a verse from, well, a couple of verses from John 10. I won't read them to you, but it's verses 22 to 30. The little like tab at the top of your Bible will tell you that it literally is says, I and the Father are one. That's like the little like about it. Um, so basically it's the Jews like going up to Jesus and being like, tell us if you're the Christ, like prove it. And he's like, I told you. And then it ends like verse 30 it literally is, I and the Father are one. So like I guess the takeaway point is like, like the whole point of that is the Jews, they don't know him. They're not taking the time to listen to him. They're not believing him. They're not growing in a relationship with him like the disciples. Um, so to like, if you're having trouble understanding that, try to like learn more about God, work on your relationship with him because um, you won't understand it unless you take the time to learn about him. So yeah. So our question was, how do you reconcile exhaustion when being tested and tried, and is it all right to cry out for rest? Our first point was, um, it's definitely all right to cry out for rest, and it's like even encouraged. Um, in some of the first verses of the Bible, it says that God rested on the seventh day. Like, if the creator of our universe rested, it's obviously something that's really important. And, it, um, like, Jesus also rested. He, like, intentionally sought out rest to be able to get closer to God and to, like, hear from him. So it's definitely something, like, important to seek out rest in your life. Um, we also said, like, we can rest um, knowing that God is in control. So if we can find peace and rest knowing that God is going to work in our lives, it's something that we should seek a lot. Um, we said a really key component of rest is listening. It's something that we might not think of a lot, but if you're resting and listening to God, he's going to tell you things that are going to prepare you for the trials that you're facing in your life. So you should intentionally seek out rest daily and listen to what God is telling you because even though it might seem not seem like a big trial you're going through, we see like many trials every day. So we really want to be seeking him out, whether that's in prayer or reading your Bible. Um, we also kind of defined like what is rest because there are di there's definitely like a worldly rest and then more of a biblical rest 
the world kind of says like resting is more like sitting down watching tiktok or looking at the news like you're not doing something like active but you're resting but that's that's what's feeding your soul so if you're sitting down and when you have a few minutes to rest and you're watching the news or watching tiktok like that's what you're going to be listening to but if you sit down and intentionally like pray and listen for god's voice or read your bible it's going to be feeding your soul in a way that's going to help you prepare for your day and the trials that you're going to face So we said, like, really consider what you're seeking out as rest in your daily life and kind of assess if it's something good or if it's something more negative and try and implement things that are going to actually, like, feed your soul in a good way. And then um, we said that crying out for rest is actually something that's really good because you're submitting to God. So you can seek out good rest, but it's only going to take you to a certain point. If you intentionally cry out to God and say, like, I've come to my end, I need you to give me rest and peace, it's going to offer you something even more than what you can provide for yourself. And then to kind of answer the first question, like, how do you reconcile exhaustion? We said, um, like Romans 5, you rejoice in suffering. And I like to think that the enemy is going to attack you a lot when you're intentionally seeking out God. Like he doesn't like that. He's going to try and tear you down and lead you astray from what God's plan is for you. So if you're being attacked and you feel so exhausted from that, just it should be an encouragement. Like that should empower you because – That's Satan trying to tear you down, but you should just kind of see that as something like, wow, I must be doing something really good in God's kingdom because he doesn't like that. And that's all we had.